Hello. I would like to talk to folks today about the business model of the two by twos. The reason I want to discuss this is because I get a lot of questions about it. Um, people don't understand that a two by two organization is in fact a business. All churches are businesses. And there are different kinds of businesses and it's important to understand what exactly the business model is of the business. So the first thing we should ask, is the two by two organization a nonprofit business? Meaning that is it registered as a nonprofit? Well, it's not. It's not registered as a nonprofit. It's not registered as anything. It's not registered at all. So this is very different than any other church you'd ever encounter, they're all registered as nonprofits. And what that means is they have to file financial reports every year that are in a public domain, which you can look at and you can see how much cash they took in and how, what, how much they spent and on what, sort of generally what they spent it on. Um, and because they are nonprofit status, they are not taxed on their income, and they're not supposed to have much income. They can have a little bit, but um, what I mean by income is, of course, revenue minus expenses. So they just why generally uh, churches are always spending money on things. So they're building campuses or whatever because they need to spend their revenue so that they have very little income. Otherwise, they're going to violate the terms of being a nonprofit. So with the two by twos. They don't, they're not registered as a nonprofit. They're not registered as anything. So they should be paying tax on their income, but they're not. They're somehow making sure that their revenue minus expenses is not disclosed to the government. Now, how is that happening? Well, the first is they don't have a legal organization, they don't have a legal entity. There's no two by two incorporated or two by two limited. There's nothing. So the money that they're collecting is, is the same thing as if 10 kids in the schoolyard were collecting money and then spending it on whatever their expenses, chocolate bars. So it's totally informal. Now you may think, well, that's just fine. Well, it's fine if the monies involved are small. But in the case of the two by twos, the money involved are large sums. We're talking hundreds of millions of dollars. Now, so if you don't disclose those kinds of levels of cash flow to the IRS, in the case of the United States, <clears throat> that's considered money laundering. Um, it's, it's equivalent to the same as if you're a drug dealer. If you're a drug dealer and you take in, let's say, $50,000 a month in cash. You can't put that money in a bank account. Because as soon as you do, the bank will, they have internal controls that say, this is strange, there's $50,000 a month in cash coming in from unrecognized sources, it's just cash. So we're going to flag this for money laundering purposes, and they will, uh, someone will investigate this, right? Because the bank, if they're providing banking services to a, money, to a illegitimate enterprise like drug dealers, the bank will be fined by the government for money laundering. So that's why banks <clears throat> won't accept this kind of amount of cash coming in without uh, disclosures and without investigation. Now, with the two by twos, they're taking in that kind of money, like $50,000 a month for sure, way more than that, in fact. But in order to make sure that they don't trigger these anti money laundering controls that are in the banks, they do not put the money in banks. Okay, so they're doing the same thing a drug dealer does, which is a drug dealer can't put his money in a bank. Well, two by twos are not either. Okay, so first of all, they're not paying tax. And number two, they're evading anti money laundering laws. Okay, these are major felony crimes. So, what um, you think, well, how do you know that? Well, I know that because based on watching the money flow. So, here's how money flow works on two by twos you go to convention. You see the workers, <clears throat> you may give them $1,000 in cash or whatever you're about to give. They immediately take, give that cash to their overseers. Okay? 
Now, let's say you gave them a $1,000 check. What do they do with the check? They don't want a check. So what they do is they will sign the back of it, turn it into effective cash, right? They've endorsed the check. They'll give the check to someone, some friend who will then cash it. And then they give the cash back to the worker and the worker will give the cash to the overseer, okay? The important thing here is that no worker or overseer is cashing checks and okay? they can't have that. They need only cash. Okay, so they have huge sums of cash. And you'll hear about this, that at many conventions, there'll be huge suitcases full of cash at the end of the convention. But what do they do with the cash? They can't go to a bank, right? So where does it go? Okay, well, so <clears throat> you think, well, they have these trust funds. Well, you can't set up trust funds with cash that's undisclosed because a trust fund is a legal entity. It's in, you know set up by a bank or a trust company. So how are you going to put it in there without triggering anti-money laundering laws? can't. So what is happening to this cash? Because it's clear that two by twos do not have hundreds of million dollars of cash laying around. That's very unsafe, right? What they're doing, they have some trusted, um, say, friends. We'll call them two by two royalty who are in on this whole thing. They know how it works. And the cash is given to them, okay? Now, these friends, they have private businesses of their own. Now, it's usually real estate. They have some sort of business that has large, has real estate ownership and things like that. And why do I say real estate? Because real estate is one of the few ways you can pay for something, something large with cash and not set off any alarm bells, okay? So this is very notorious in large U.S. metro cities that many, many expensive apartments and so forth are bought with cash by very, say, undesirable people, okay? Criminals. And that's how they launder the money. So in the two-by-twos royalty, they're doing the same thing. Well, I don't think they're buying $20 million apartments in New York City, but they're, they're buying real estate probably around them probably real estate that they use for their own business, right? So if they're involved in some kind of construction or whatever, something they're going to, so they're using this to, um, and they basically they're taking this cash from the overseas and they're laundering it with their own business, okay? Now, you think, oh, that can't happen. Yes, that can happen. That happens a lot in our country. And um, the two by twos are no different. So there's significant money laundering going on, significant tax evasion, right? I mean, if they just would register as a nonprofit, they'd be a legal non-entity, uh, sorry, a legal entity, and then you could donate your money to the two by two, two by two limited, whatever, and uh, you would get a tax receipt and they could put the money in a bank. No taxes paid, no money laundering problems, okay? That's how it should work. That's how all churches work. That's not what two by twos are doing, okay? They are not paying taxes, they don't, but they do not have um, uh, non-profit status, they don't have any kind of legal status, and they are money laundering. Now, there are a number of other examples we know of um, that demonstrate that they, they are aware that they're money laundering, and uh, they've tried to avoid getting caught. So one story, it's back in the 90s, I think, there was a worker, I think it's in Alberta, Canada, and he tried to cross the border a significant amount of cash from uh, into the United States. And um, the thing is, you cannot cross the border with uh, more than more than $10,000 without disclosing it. Okay, so if, if they stop you and say, if you got more than $10,000, you say, no, I don't. And they search you and they find that you have more than 10000 it's a felony crime. Okay, and they can seize all the money. However, if they say, you have more than $10,000 on you, you say, yes, I do. I have whatever fifty thousand dollars. They'll make you sign some papers, and uh, they'll check you to see how much money you have. Yes, you have fifty thousand. No problem. You disclose it. You can enter with the money. No problem. Okay. So this worker, he tried to. He went to the border with far more than ten thousand dollars, and um, he wouldn't disclose it. In fact, he refused to cross the border. So you have the option, you know, at all times to 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 turn around. And that's what he did. He, went, he ran back to 
Alberta, and he gave the money to some friend, and then he, then he went back to the border with no cash and continued on. So again, why would he do this? Why would he go to so much trouble to get rid of this cash? Because he could have just disclosed it. He said, yeah, I have $50,000 or whatever it was, and move on and go continue on. With the, money. the reason is because when you disclose it, you have to write a, sign a bunch of papers and say, you know, I'm Eldon Tennis, whatever it was, and I have $50,000 from transporting across the border. He doesn't want that in the government records, okay, because that will be evidence of money laundering. If, if, if they ever investigate this guy for money laundering for some other reason, they find out he's moving less money across the borders, they got him, okay? So that's one. Of, that's the reason, is the evasion of money laundering. So there's a lot of other examples, but this is the basic thing. So <clears throat> just to be aware of that. Now, how does the actual business model itself work? So, again, I said it's a business, but it's not set up as a legal business in the sense of the legal entity. But it is. it does have a business structure to it, okay? And the structure is the following. It's basically the, the world is divided to different called um, regions. And each region <clears throat> is overseen by a, what they call overseer. And um, this overseer has under him a bunch of workers. And these workers are out basically soliciting money from their, what they call friends, which are the laity. Now, they say that they don't take money. And you go to the gossip and they say, we don't take money. But in the privacy of your home, when they talk to you, they want money. Okay? And that's why they just collected all this money, this hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, this structure is really interesting because you could think of these workers as basically development officers, right? They're basically sucking in cash. Most of the cash they suck in, they send it up to the overseer. Um, they keep very little for themselves. I mean, tiny percentage, single digit percentages. And why? Because they do not need to provide any housing or food or transportation for themselves. The laity, the friends, are providing that all for them in addition to giving them cash because these ministers are, are staying in the homes of the laity. They're eating in the homes of the laity. They're driving the cars of the laity and so forth. They, they are complete. All their expenses are taken care of. Maybe they have to buy socks or something like that. But again, the major expenses that any other kind of development officer at any other business would have, they do not have. Okay, so... Uh, the overseers have figured out a way to offload all the expenses of their development officers onto the people they're stealing from, which are the laity. That's, that's incredible. I've never seen anything like this. Now, um, these, these laity, you might think like, well, they're called friends. Well, you know, friends is a pretty good word for it, right? And generally, when we see people getting taken advantage like this, we call them suckers. Right. This is and it's again it's an it's a very similar um, or well known um, con trick when you try to gain the confidence of your your mark, which is in this case they're saying well we don't we don't take any money we just you know we're indigent we don't need anything we're just spreading the gospel well <laughs> how come they're taking so much money then right so the con is we don't need your money and then of course. We're giving you this free gift for the gospel. Then, of course, you feel guilty. You say, well, I, I've, I've got the gospel. I'm, you know, I'm going to heaven now because of you. So I have to give you all this money, right? That's the con. Um, and it's really sad. So, so it's not only cash um, money in terms of like these donations from day to day these workers are taking. Their big slug of cash money they take is what's called bequeathments. So, they want to get old people uh, to sign over their estates to the workers or to the overseers or to the the two-by-two uh, two royalty. And there are many, many cases of this. This is where the vast majority of the money comes from. And, you know, old people, they're lonely, and they got, they're getting visited by these workers all the time. And these workers are working on them. Trying to get them to you know give your money to the kingdom, to the kingdom, to the kingdom. These old people are just happy to have someone to like appears to take an interest in them, right? And sure enough, they'll sign it over. We even have uh, some documents of overseers that 
have written legal documents to having a will to uh, if you want to give all your money to those they have a couple of those they're very interesting you know it's pretty clear what what's the most important goal of this outfit it's not to spread the gospel it's to take people's money and well i can give you an example of that in the 1990s late 1990s there was kind of a kerfuffle in alberta apparently some of the overseers there had um set up a legal entity uh, under their names. I think there was three or four of them. And it was a for-profit entity. And the reason was is because they had gotten some mineral rights, or some oil drilling properties or something from one of these friends. And they were putting up in their own name. Again, why did they put it up as a for-profit entity? Because they were the shareholders, these four guys, and they were going to take the income that come off these off these assets. They had it made it as a uh, non-profit, which would have been a smart thing. Then they, as the directors, wouldn't be able to take the money for themselves, right? So that's why they set it up like that. And the queer thing is that somehow this legal documents of this entity they set up were just, were released to the public in the sense that like somebody found out about it and squealed. Well, the thing is, how how did that happen so quickly, right? I mean. They got it set up, and within months, it was widely known amongst these friends in Alberta. Well, in those days, you know, you just couldn't search on the internet for all new companies being set up and who the boards of directors are and stuff. So clearly, someone on the inside knew. Someone close to these overseers knew what, what they'd done. So, And I think that was someone who they were trying to squeeze out. It was probably... An, uh, a two by two royalty who thought they should have got them these assets under their control as opposed to these overseers putting it in their own name because that's kind of queer that overseers are putting it in their own name usually that's not how it's done but so I think that's what happened they squeaked on them anyways created a big kerfuffle amongst the friends of course because they're not two by twos are not supposed to have any legal entities they say but like the church isn't so there was um, a basically a big revolt. And um, some workers were sent to quell a revolt. Basically, what they did was excommunicate anyone who wouldn't um, stand down, wouldn't shut up. And, okay, so fast forward, after they excommunicated quite a few people. But the workers who excommunicated, did the excommunicating of these friends, these, it's a couple of workers, three, three or something, they were after it was all done they were sent to foreign countries i mean they were sent to i think it was one it was argentina it was something else countries that they didn't know the language for now this is very strange right why would you send people who've apparently done a good service for you to foreign countries well they didn't do a good service the point is these ones who did excommunication were supposed to knock people back in line not to get them to exodus so they were punished by being sent, being sent to these foreign countries where they didn't know the language. Now, contrast that with, there's an enormous number of these of other workers who have sexually abused children. We're talking, you know, 500, 600 of them. And they are not transferred anywhere to foreign countries where they don't know the language. Quite the contrary. They're transferred just to, you know, a few states over, a few hundred miles over. I mean, because clearly what's important is not a sexually assaulting a child. What's important for these people is losing cash flow, right? When you excommunicate a bunch of people, you use, lose the cash flow. So you can kind of always interpret what people's real motivations and goals are by their actions. Now, you may wonder, like, are these two by twos the, the workers themselves like filing tax reports with the, with the government IRS? No, they're not. They don't file IRS tax reports. I mean, which if you don't make any income, you don't have to by law. But it's a good idea to do so, um, just to have a record with the government for there's, there's things called low income tax credits and stuff. So, but they don't. Why? Because what are they going to put on it? Did their employer is the two by twos incorporated? They don't have a, a legitimate employer. There's nothing they can put on there. If they do say they're taking in money, well, 
there's that's going to alert the money laundering flags, right? So that's why they don't do it. Okay, so let's say, well, well, in the United States, if you work for more than 10 years in your life and you qualify for what's called Medicare when you age 65, which is basically free health insurance for people over 65, well, how are these workers going to qualify for that when they're over 65? Well, they don't, right? So what happens is there's either two scams are pulled. The first is some point in their life, they'll get put on the payroll, the two by two business. Now they won't actually work there. They don't actually receive any money, but they get put on the payroll so that it looks like they worked there for 10 years and then they qualify for Medicaid. Okay. So if they don't pull that scam, the other scam they pull is they say, this person, this worker is an is, um, indigent, they don't, they're in extreme poverty, and they qualify for, for Medicaid, which is a different program in the U.S. It's for people who are essentially the most poor people in our country. I and mean, they get free health care for it. So these workers are getting free, free health care, either one scam or the other. Right? Now here's the dirty thing about it. There are a number of two by two friends, okay, and they're probably two by two royalty in the United States who have set up what call assisted living facilities, which are basically old folks' homes, you know, with nurses and doctors and all that stuff. And they have these old workers living in there and it's a company owned by this two by two royalty of course but who's paying for the nurses and all this well it's the u.s government it's the medicaid or medicare right so I mean, this is a horrible scam right They're, they it's awful anyways that's how they do it so you may even ask well when two by two workers go to a different country like how do they get in you don't catch this site I'm going to go to your country for like 10 years and spread the gospel. You're not part of a legitimate organization. Well, correct, you can't. You know, if you're an American citizen and you go to Italy, you can only go for 90 days. You're a tourist. That's it. So how are these people doing? Well, what they do is they get a student visa to learn the language, they say. Okay, so they get some, get in with their student visa, learn the language, but they're not learning. So they have no intention to learn a language. Their entire thing is to get in there and to so-called spread the gospel, which really means to solicit donations to try to get people into their essentially criminal enterprise. So that also goes on. That's fraud, of course. Um, really bad. Unfortunately, you may think all these workers are, you know, involved in criminal activity and they know all about it. So that's not true. Most of the workers don't even know what's going on. They're really just super naive. And the reason is almost every worker, contemporarily at least, was born and raised in this cult. And so, and they've been told their entire childhood that the most important thing to do with your life is to become a worker. So when they reach about their teenage years, there's enormous pressure put on them to join, become a worker. Um, and when you do you want to become a worker, you have to give away all the wealth you have. You have a car, you have to give it away, or whatever. You have to, well, you sell it, actually. Then you have to give your money, the money to the overseer. Yes, you don't give things away, but then you, you sell everything and you give the money to the overseer. Of course, now you're homeless. Um, you have no transportation. You have no income. Um, and you can be fired at will by the overseer, right? So if you're fired, then all the friends are going to not, they're not going to give you a place to live, right? They're not going to let you in their homes. They're not going to give you their car. They're not going to feed you. So you've just sold yourself into slavery. Okay. So that's what they're doing. It's basically training young children, conditioning them to human traffic into slavery, sell themselves into slavery. Terrible situation. So, yeah, the majority of them are actually in this sort of bondage, and they can't get out. And so any kind of abuse that comes their way from overseers or fellow workers, they have to put, they have to just absolve, like take it. They can't do anything about it. They can't complain or anything. They'll get punished. So this is why the incidents of 
of mental health, mental illness among these workers is sky high. The number who are on antidepressants and anti-anxiety pills is uh, probably near, near 100%. I mean, it's really, really bad. Um, the other interesting thing, if you're you know, quite idealistic, a worker, you're going to just be a foot soldier in this whole enterprise. The people who get promoted are all super corruptible people, right? And the overseers, they identify corruptible people quickly, right? They, they have some little falsehood they ask you to tell a lie about. If you refuse, they know that you're not corruptible. You go along with it. Okay, they got you. Now you told one lie. So next time we'll try to get you to tell a second lie. And uh, you can't say no, because if you do, we can disclose that you told a lie in the first place. So that's how they do it. They get they get you on these, let's say, indiscretions. Now, it's not just telling lies or getting you on. The main indiscretion they try to get people on, the overseers try to get their workers on so they can corrupt them, is sexual indiscretion. So they know that these workers who are supposedly supposed to be celibate or supposed to be actually chaste, uh, not, not having sex, are in fact not trained to be chaste. They don't know how to control themselves. And they are tempted nonstop from other workers and from being in the homes of the laity. There's nonstop temptation and they slip. And so whether it's homosexual or heterosexual or with kids, um, it's happening all, almost all the time. And so the use of what we call, say, blackmail on people who have these and so indiscretions or crimes in some of the case is how they keep them in line and how they get them to do further bad deeds to go along with things. And most importantly, to make them uh, not... Um, not not resist any kind of otherwise irrational demands that these overseers put on them when they you know when they tell the workers like you've got to excommunicate X Y Z lady because whatever some stupid reason the worker can't say no I think that's wrong the worker has to go along with it because if he doesn't or she doesn't there all of these indiscretions will be disclosed okay so it's an entire blackmail as a currency operation which is, this is not uncommon. We've seen this in other institutions as well that have similar types of power structures. So there's, like I said, enormous amount of uh, criminal activity uh, from the money laundering, the, it's effectively human transport to child sexual assault and so forth. And we, child sexual assault is astronomical, right? We, we know there's over 600 perpetrators and over over 3,000 uh, victims so far. And the investigation's looming on for not even six months. It's just an astronomical level. Um, the rates of homosexuality in the in the workers is really high. It could be upwards of 30, 30 35, 40 percent. It's really high. Um, it's because it's a forced environment. Um, there's also all these cases of uh, of rape, actually, not only of children, but um, you know, really a lot of this child sexual assault and rape happens on um, post pubescent girls. Actually, they're, they're basically groomed into these positions of of child sexual assault, and it's crazy enough. A lot of the parents are assisting in the grooming because the parents allow these workers into the homes and these parents treat the workers as if they're angels can do no wrong and that the children should um, basically venerate them and so if the workers uh, the workers know they have this child who's just admiring them you know at maximal level the worker can easily manipulate this child right so you can imagine a 28 year old male worker with a 16 year old female congregant living in her home with her parents you know she's all over these workers in terms of uh, you know admiring them and so forth and you know, giving them attention and these workers are going to probably take advantage of it you know so that's kind of how the parent the parents are highly complicit in this I mean I don't think the parents know 
that's what's going to happen. But they are stupid, and um, if you do this sort of thing, and it happens, it kind of, you know, you should, you're culpable. It's a really sad thing for the children, though. They don't know any better. They're just kind of led like sleep sheep to the slaughter. There are some other issues too, like with why do these two by twos have so many foreign missions, like into third world countries? It's really strange when you go into look at how much uh, financial resources they're spending to maintain these workers in these other countries, because like there's no, they're hardly picking up any cash in those countries. It's, it's all being supported by the cash flow in North America primarily. And there's a number of reasons. One of them is that you'll notice certain countries are, there's a lot of these male workers going there, not permanently, but for temporary periods, you know, for a few months or whatever. And that's basically their rest and relaxation. They're going there. They can be, you know, as indiscretionary as they want. And in particular, there's a lot in around Thailand, right? So they're going there for sex tourism. It's just, it's a sad state of affairs, but this is what goes on. The if you're a two by two worker and you want to get out, or you don't, or you disobey the overseer and get pushed out, you're homeless. You don't have a place to live. You don't have any money. You don't. You don't even have enough to buy, you know, a city bus ticket. Nothing. You're no food. You move. You go from being in the luxury of staying in all these sometimes wealthy people's homes and being fed to homeless in an instant. Um, and that causes enormous perverse behavior in these workers. Um, so the idea that somehow you're going to get a fair shake by appealing to a worker, you think you're a bit hard done by by their superior or whatever, forget it. No, there's the incentive structure is all aligned against you. The other thing is about the, the laity. The, the laity doesn't understand that the workers control all the doors, all the gates. And the, the main gate that they control is baptism. You know, it doesn't sound like much, but it's very important in this case. So if you join a two-by-twos, it's expected that you'll be baptized by a two-by-two two minister. And you, you, if you were baptized in another church previously, they don't care. That's irrelevant. You they, they consider that baptism as not valid. So they will rebaptize you. Okay? Now, why does that matter? Because no other church does that. All churches consider a baptism done in, in another church as a valid, even done by anybody. Like a regular person could baptize someone else, and the church will consider it valid as long as the correct words are said and so on. But in a two-by-two two case, it's not. So they're not actually baptizing you into Christianity. They're baptizing you into the two-by-two two cult. Okay. So if you don't get baptized, well, then you can't go to heaven, obviously. No salvation. So the two-by-two two ministers, they decide who gets baptized or not. If you, they don't like your clothes you wear, they don't like what your hairstyle is, whatever their problem is with you, they will refuse to baptize you. Well, if Okay, you get if they refuse to baptize you. Then in these meetings they have it's cult meetings. You're not allowed to do anything but just sit there. Basically, you're not allowed to take uh, to participate in communion with them. So you can't. You know how are you going to go to get your salvation? And go to heaven, right? You're just sitting there. So that's how they they can control the gate. Now these meetings they're in someone's home. Well, the home is a private property of the congregant, and the congregant can deny you entry into his home, right? So let's say the workers have a problem with you. They can tell the guy who owns the home, he's an elder, say, don't let XYZ in your house for a Sunday meeting. Well, you're banned. You can't get in there. I mean, what are you going to appeal to the police? You can't. Nothing you can do. So these people control all the gates, right? There's, they let you in. And they lock you in, and if you start to make any trouble, like asking questions, they can shut you off. And then they'll cut you off from all of your friends and family who are inside. Right? You'll be ostracized and shunned. That's the common thing. So if you 
if you let if you're forced out or whatever or if you happen to smart enough to leave on your own essentially you you lose your entire social network and this is what is such a big problem for people in this cult and they and they that's why they mostly don't won't leave because they're they can't imagine life or can't tolerate life having to rebuild an entire new social network to gotcha so it's a it's a cult and it's basically run like any other um criminal enterprise really is it's really like a mafia and these overseers you'd think that they would be all working together as a kind of you know organized institution but they're not actually it's like each region has an overseer like in western u.s or eastern u.s they're actually in competition with each other it's um they're like a mafia boss and they try to take over the other guy's territory to get the money flow out of it it's just standard um, it's very sad, you know. And there's people who actually get killed in this outfit. I mean, it always happens, you know. Like, well, was it, he took a bunch of pills, or he drowned in a bathtub, or whatever. But there's people who got who get killed. Um, very sad. So, that is the two by two business model. It's nefarious. Um, there are ways to bring it down. It will involve the FBI. Um. But uh, it's going to require certain things to be triggered for the FBI to be able to bring prosecution. 